Amen. We appreciate you all this morning. Uh, today, we're going to go ahead and jump right out into the word today. So good to see you all here today. Y'all are in this place today. And God bless you. Looking forward for this, um, this summer. We're on vacation month. I am really pondering, honestly, and I, I, I've shared it with my team, and I have just been thoroughly enjoying the Rock Now time with my family, with your family connecting. Um, it's just been so purposeful. I, I, I remember on most Wednesday nights, most of us are just like, especially the those that serve on, on Wednesday nights, and, and, and because we put all this on every twice a week normally. I mean, we all, one had a few weeks off over the last couple of weeks, and usually you're rushing and trying to get home and get kids something to eat and throwing something down their throat real quickly and jumping to church. And most of you don't feed your children probably to after church or you're running through the drive through on the way home. And, and man, this purposeful time in the face of our family has been such an amazing time for me. You know, I am so, I'm, I, honestly, I'm developing, I'm changing, I'm evolving as a, even as a pastor you know, to know that it's really more about connecting than anything else. And I've connected with your family, my family more. So I've cooked, man, we, 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 and y'all be, y'all be showing out with those meals. And, and to see the love that has been exhibited, I'm thinking, I'm really pondering of some continuations of that. Um, um, thinking about having like a first Wednesday big worship night uh, and prayer and a word like once a month and then back online virtual but with some more intimate teachings meaning having some teachings done at the 715 to 745 hour by the various ministers that we have having them come up and just doing it on a virtual level and having it already prepared for you all very good worship and word as well so pray with us uh, we'll be sending out a survey tomorrow as well, just to get some feedback. I, I want to know. I'm, I'm trying to lead from this center place and just really hearing the needs of the people and see. Because some folks, you know, if you don't do something, they think that you are this or that or you, you're not loving God. But we've been going hard since the pandemic. Like, we haven't stopped. We haven't had no real virtual stuff since June of last year. I mean, we've been still moving forward in every capacity. And But I honestly, when I tell you the truth, I've been enjoying uh, Wednesday night. It, ain't, it has not been a break for me. It's been a blessing to me. Amen. Anybody say the same thing for y'all? It's been a blessing to your life? Clap if you say that. Say, okay. All right. That's a good consistency. And, and so uh, I got some ideas of some new music, you know, to prepare for. I mean, um, coming out. I mean, we, we've been working on some music for a while. We want to we wanna cut some albums. Amen. And so we can work on those things. And I mean, just so many ideas to make this ministry that much more than just a moment, but a something that ministers to your life throughout the week. You can pop in or, or download something and just hear the worship and the things like that throughout the week. And so God is just laying some things on my heart and my spirit. So I just want to put it out there in the atmosphere. Sometimes you got to speak those things that are not as though they are and get it on your heart. And so you already have an understanding that God is doing some amazing things. Would you pray with me now, Father, in the name of Jesus? Lord, we are grateful and thankful for this hour, this moment, this opportunity. God, that we've gathered in your place with your people, connected in this room and online as well. So God, I ask that every word that will be spoken, that will come out of my mouth and the meditations of my very heart, be acceptable unto you, God, for you are my strength and my redeemer. Lord, I'm grateful as well for every listening ear in this room online and even later, God, I pray that they have an ear to hear what you, the Spirit of the Lord, has to say. God, I thank you for the connection from those near and far, those that have traveled, those that have uh, went here and there to connect. Matter of fact, that person that rushed through whatever checkpoint they had to get through to connect the service today or the person that, 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 that allowed God to come in, not interrupt, but come in and to their vacation time and they're sitting there, maybe in their hotel room, receiving this moment right now. I pray that you bless them as well, abundantly and every level. And so God, we're thankful and grateful for your word today. Why? Because it's your word that makes us new. Your word that teaches us about you. So make it clear 
and make it plain. In Jesus' name, would you shout amen? Come on, give God a praise in the house right there. All right. All right, real loud and proud. Let me see them what? Put your Bibles in the air and wave them like you do care. Amen. If you need one, please signal the ushers. They walking down the aisles. I like a, I was preaching last night at a church, and, and um, I, I, I say, let me see them Bibles. I like a physical Bible. I, I read this thing as often as I can. And I can tell you the truth. A Bible that's falling apart will also show you a life that's not. Amen to that, somebody. If your Bible probably still intact, your life may not be as intact as you think it is. And when hardship comes, this word, when I tell you this word works at every level of life, no matter what has taken place in your life, this word works. Somebody shout it works. Amen. Let's just go ahead and give them a hand, y'all, as they readjust themselves as well. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Real, real quickly, I want to draw fire, go higher, then retire. As I continue this series, part six of the series entitled Stronger. Would you shout stronger? stronger. Oh, put a little grunt in your voice. Shout stronger. stronger. I said I said stronger. I'm sorry. I just that came out a southern boy. Say stronger. stronger. Amen. I like it like that. God bless you today. And so as we move forward today in this moment. I really wanted to find some things continually. I don't know what part you are participating in today, but I want to be able to share with you to bring you up the speed of our progress. I believe that we are becoming stronger. Now, it's not, amen, thank you. And I appreciate the moment that we can share because it's not adding anything to your life. God has given you everything in life and godliness to be everything he's purposed you to be. However, those things that God has given us on the inside, gifts and talents and inspirations and ideas, they also need to be developed. And so one of our goals here during this series is that we become stronger at it. Would you shout stronger at it? I want you to become stronger at doing this Christian life. I need you to become stronger at participating in the promises of God. And so know that it's on the inside of you, but as you develop this thing and really work this thing, you'll find yourself connected to God in such a way where you'll become stronger and stronger. So as we define stronger in this series, we found out that stronger means to be able to be to move heavy weights or accomplish demanding task and also it's, it's also possessing a skill set a mindset a, a, a mentality that says I have the ability to accomplish and be successful it takes a strong mind to overcome obstacles. That person that may be talking about you on your job and you ain't let them mess up your money. Amen. That takes a strong mind to continue on. It's also the ability to take on pressure and great force and it's that person as well that is not easily affected by difficulties or calamity or hardships in their life our foundation scripture real quickly you don't have to really turn to it but if you want to write a note it's Ephesians chapter 6 I want to I have to put this out there because it's so important to the progress of where we are and Ephesians 6 real quickly the first um, the first the only verse I want to read is verse number 10 where it says Finally, be strong in the Lord and not yours, but in his mighty power. Every time I read this, I get the understanding that God is fighting for me, that God is fighting for you. This is that song been playing in my ear all week. That song that this is how I fight my battles. Like, like, I hear the song, but I, would, I had to get a mental picture. What do you look like when you're fighting your battles? Do you look like the hell you've been through? Do you represent, can somebody always tell when you're going through? Is it obvious when calamity hit your life that confusion began to be your motive? See, this is how we become stronger at it, because we take on more than maybe the world think we can. Sometimes when the enemy thought he buried you and you see you standing the next day, it's like, man, 
God is doing something strong in their life. And I like the way the message says, it says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. Somebody shout, he wants me strong. So we've been dealing with a few things here, the reality of the word. That's one of the things we've been talking about because the word is realer than anything in this world. I know that we think we battle against flesh and blood and things of this earth or the carnal minds of things, but the Bible clearly lets us know that we wrestle not against those things, but principalities and powers, spiritual witnesses in high and low places, rulers of the darkness and the unseen world. Things that we can't see is at war against the things that are in our lives and the things that we see we want to do, but we realize that the word overtakes anything that the world can bring up against us. And we discover in these weeks that how we become stronger at it is by feeding our spirit. Somebody shout, feed your spirit. I'm going to keep going down the line. Build your faith. Somebody shout, build your faith. Amen. Somebody shout, speak the word. Somebody shout, control your thought life. You got to bring every thought under captivity as well. And you got to be strong to do that. Because a weak-minded person allow their thoughts to wander and become exactly whatever the situation looks like. How many of you can walk in a doctor's office and they tell you you got cancer, lupus, or something, and you can walk out of there and say, I'm already healed, I'm already healed. Like literally after seeing the diagnosis, can declare that by his stripes, not by this report, but by his stripes, I'm already healed. And so we discovered as well that not only do you control your thought life, but we ended even on last week about praying in the spirit. Somebody shout, pray in the spirit. And we, we touched on Jude chapter 1 verse 20 where it talks about you know, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. And it is our responsibility as Christians to build ourselves up. It's not my job. I'm, my job as your pastor is to proclaim the word of God, but it's your job to build yourself up. I can't pray with you every morning. I, I, I'm not there in a situation, I mean, but God is, and that's why you got to make sure you're connecting to the things of God so that God can interrupt, interfere in the situations that you may be facing. And that's why this stronger, this building up of your faith, it requires us to put a demand on our faith. we got all the faith we need. We've been dealt, each man, woman, boy, and girl, the measure of faith, but we have to make a demand on that faith. And God, when we make a demand on our faith, we can command our situations. Somebody shout, when I make a demand, I can make a command. You can't command nothing to change if you're not making demands on your faith every day. God, I know I got more in me than what I see. God, I know that there's more potential than what's presented. And so here we know that there's some benefits of praying in the Spirit. We talked about that because praying in the Spirit is not your impressive language, but your effective language. Amen. I know that sometimes, man, we'll be quick. Somebody start speaking in tongues, we think they got everything. But it's not your impressive language, it's your effective language. It's the language that allows you to communicate with God and the devil himself don't know what you're talking about. He can't interrupt that. It's, it's like your spiritual Morse code. You can communicate with God. God can communicate back with you and change your situation before your enemy knows it. They'll still be stuck at the last place they saw you. That's why by the time Jesus got up, the devil was like, what happened? I thought I killed him. But the power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power living on the inside of every person in this room that professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the fact of the matter is that he, he got up, you already know, not if, but he got up to give us all the know that we can get up out of our situation. So here's the benefit of praying in the spirit. It impacts every situation of your life. It builds up strength of your inner man. It allows you to pray the perfect will of God. I was sharing last week, man, we even laughed about it, that if, 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 I, if I ask anybody in this room how they would like to die, everybody would say they want to die in their sleep. Nobody want the cancer, corona, uh, uh, anything. I mean, kidney disease, none of that stuff. You all, everybody would choose the easy way out. But what happens when the hard times come? 
What, see, what happened is that it allows you, when you pray in the Spirit, it allows you to pray the perfect will of God. God, no matter what, that's why Jesus was able to say, God, no matter what happens, God, let God take this cup from me, but let your will be done. It was not a compromise. It was a spiritual connection saying, God, I know I could cop out, but I need to connect with you and confirm your will for my life because when your will is done, there will be nothing I can accomplish. It also imparts spiritual secrets to you. It brings things to fruition in your life you probably didn't know about yourself, and it reveals things to you that you didn't know about even others. It also brings a place of rest and refreshing. Man, I'm telling you, man, I've been through some things I know you have as well, and I can get on my knees and pray in the Holy Ghost, and I, wait, I get up off my knees, and it'll be as if nothing ever happened. I'm like, God, why I feel such a rest and a refreshing? He said, because you tapped into a well that never runs dry. Oh, I'm telling you, these, these are things that we can do in our life that will cause this because ultimately, all of those things that I talked about, it ultimately, uh, ultimately allows you to rid yourself of the way. Somebody shout, rid yourself of the way. And that's what I want to dig into today. Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 12? Because a lot of times we think that to become stronger, we got to pick up more weight. But that may be true on the physical sense, but in the spiritual realm, I believe that we're going to have to lay aside some weights to become stronger at our race. Hebrews chapter 12, very familiar scripture, and it has so much essence and effectiveness to this that I got to spend some time here. Like, I got to. Like, like, when I was reading this and understanding this, it spoke to my very soul and spirit. Y'all there? I'm going to start at verse number one. And I like, I like to read it from the New King James Version. I've read this totally different. Than I, I, and, and I got a picture of my grandmother, Mother Parson, uh, her hospitality suite. Y'all got to go in there and see if y'all feel for the first time or you want to see. Uh, um, this woman... Um, is amazing. Even as I was talking to some of my relatives this week, they was imparting more wisdom that came from her that just reconfirmed some things in me uh, regarding the wisdom of those that have went on before us. And so in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 12, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. This word endurance represents strength. It, it, it's, it's, it's the ability to last to the end. And so the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, for who, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Last week I asked you, are you going to the phone or to the throne? For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Let me read it one more time from another moment and message. It says here from the message translation, it says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, never quit. No extra spiritual facts, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, Go over to the story. Go over, the, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Amen to that, somebody. Now, let me make this as clear and plain as possible. There is an expression to call something to mind here while interfering 
with the thoughts of the previous chapter. I have to make this as best I can for you all today, us all, is that there is a mindset and interference with what was going on in the 11th chapter. See, a lot of times when we read Hebrews 11, we love the first few verses where it talks about now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We hold on to that. It goes to a hall of fame of faith. But around the end of that chapter, it starts dealing with some stuff that we don't like to deal with. It ends the chapter of 11 by stating that there were people that prayed in faith but didn't get what they prayed for, but still had faith to the very end. And so it tells me at times that we as believers only have faith to see what is in front of us. And a lot of times, if we don't get what we want from God, we stop trusting him. We stop. So what happened is that there are people that was before us, there was people that preceded us, even in the previous chapter, that prayed in faith, but they, did ne they never saw the, what they were praying for, but the Bible says they were still counted as the faithful. See, in times you may be, that's why I tell you, people, if they had a choice of how they would want to go out or what they want to see happen, they would choose the easiest way. But a lot of times we won't choose the hard way, but God says sometimes I may give you the hard things in life so that you can show generations to come. Anybody glad that our ancestors never quit? Anybody glad that our ancestors kept the faith to the last day that a brother like me can stand up here and proclaim freely? I mean, I don't know about you, but I think about those things. I mean, many of us can go through life and never appreciate maybe what somebody else dreamed never came true, but yours did. Never seen it. It was just a nightmare for some. But they kept the faith anyway. And our children and our children's children. And it brings me to this point. That's why the scripture brings us to this expression that the writer in chapter 12 is talking about that there were people that prayed but they still kept the faith because I want to encourage somebody here today that there is a crown for your cross. Oh, I, you may not see it all in this life, but it may be something that your children talk about 30, 40, 50 years from now. That they will remember what grandmama, granddaddy did, mama did in this life that kept the faith regardless of what calamity came upon them. In this reference, it references the Olympic Games and what a privilege it is to be right in the middle of the Olympics right now and preaching this moment. But I saw something so vivid in this text, y'all. The reference to the Olympic Games showed that there is bigger things than your current battle. Amen to that, somebody. You may think you're going through something. There's somebody that's going through something worse. Uh, but you got this to be able to say, God, I'm going to have faith for what I'm in right now because there is bigger battles out there and there's something bigger than your battle that, that you got to become stronger through your struggles. You got to become stronger through your struggles that your mishaps and your mistakes did not mark you off the list. Oh, how many know that sometimes we feel like, man, our mistakes, our mishaps marked us out of the promises of God and the world will want us to believe that. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. When you make a choice or a mistake or have a mishap in your life, the world will count you out, but there's some folks rooting for you. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. There's some folks that really depending on you to get through those hard times in your moment. There, there are folks cheering for you even when others are condemning you. Oh, that's what the scripture told us. That's why you got to get stronger at it because there are folks cheering even in the condemning places of your life. This scripture depicts the picture of how animated and enthused each runner gets when its country get, a gaze, get to gaze upon them. This is what it looks like, y'all. When you watch Olympics, how many know that everybody that's running isn't from America? I know we like the USA team, right? We like that. You know, I, they, they told me that uh, if, if, if one of the NBA players that won the, um, um, the final, if, if they went to go play in the uh, Olympics, they couldn't play for the USA. They have to play for their home team. 
And so the Olympic Games, when you look at this text, when, when, when the writer was writing this, it was depicting the enthusiasm of every runner as they were looking, they was trying to show that the person that was leading their country, they wanted to make sure that that person saw the best attitude. They wanted to make sure that the country leaders was looking upon them from the stands or from the boxes that would say, man, that person is representing our country or our region well. And that was the amazing thing because the writer here refers to the same energy and enthusiasm we as believers should have when we run in our race. See, somebody may not be cheering for you down on this earth, but that's somebody up in heaven rooting for you every chance you get. That's somebody that already see the end but at the beginning. They already said, no matter what what you're facing right now, there is a brighter day ahead of you. And sometimes we get caught up in a crowd where we should be concentrating on who's leading our life. This was the enthusiasm that they had. They said, man, my country leaders are looking at me. I'm not worried about the U.S. leaders, the China leaders. I'm worried about whatever country I'm in. And see, the country we in as Christians is the kingdom of God. And every time God looks upon us, it should make him proud at our progress. That no problem or circumstance will cause us not to run the race with great enthusiasm and energy. How you keep it going when you got things going on? You know, this is what I thought about, y'all. The finals. That was this week, right? And most of our teams weren't in it. Amen to that. Because I don't know how many of y'all are actually real Bucks fans or Suns fans. <laughs> I got to make a point here today, y'all. Y'all got to hear this one. <laughs> Jesus. The Bucks didn't win the NBA Finals from the fans they gained. Because everybody jumped on. I, I saw people with Bucks jerseys. I, I said, you probably know what a I was able to ask you what a Bucks was. He's like, giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> the Bucks didn't win the Finals by the fans that they gained. They won the Finals by the fans they already had. See, everybody jumped on when you're winning. But it was some folks in the background trading in the offseason. It was fans that were die hard. See, any Dallas Cowboy fans in here? Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amen. Ain't one in a while, but hey, y'all still what? Loyal. I tell you, I love, I, I'm not a Dallas Cowboy fan or a hater, but I love Dallas Cowboy fans. They are some of the most faithful people. I don't care if they win it or lose it, they stay what? Loyal. They used to. They used to. <laughs> That's a still affair right there. You can, hear, you can hear it all over his voice. Amen. But listen up. But the Bucks didn't win the finals based upon the fans they gained. They, they won it based upon the folks that was already on their team rooting for them. Whether they win or lose. Whether they gain a, a up or a down, there's some folks in your life ain't waiting for you just to win to get on your team. There's some folks rooting for you right now, saying that right now, if you're down or you out, I got your back. See, that's what God has purposed us to understand, that these are things that we got to really recollect in our mind. Because if we get caught up in our current fans, Jesus Christ... We'll never win nothing. We'll quit every chance we get because we're worried about what's in front of us. But God said, I already got some folks, some veterans that already been through the hell you're going through right now. I got some folks that know what it is to go through some hell and hot water that's telling you, baby, keep it going. Keep it going. Somebody shout to your neighbor and say, stop worrying about those fly-by-night fans. It's easy for folks to, for, for folks to jump on you when you're winning. When you're doing well, but when you're going through, you, that's when you look around like, okay, where they at now? What? Well, okay. You want, how many, some of y'all, one incident away from losing everybody that you thought was important and missing everybody that's his. Oh, y'all hear nothing I just said. One incident away of think, losing everybody you think is important and, and missing out on everybody that is important to you. Sometimes you ain't going to realize it until it happens to you who really got you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why this scripture tells me about something, y'all, is that it's called the process of streamlining. 
Streamlining makes you stronger. Somebody shout, streamlining makes me stronger. See, that's why you got to, in, in, in certain seasons of your life, you got to share some stuff. You got to go through some stuff. But the scripture says that you're going to have to lay aside some things. It gives, see this word streamlining or the stronger, it gives you the discipline to go the distance. It's pretty important concept in aerodynamics. Think about it. To streamline is to reduce resistance, create a faster, stronger, and smoother journey. It is the study that NASA engineers and airline pilots and shipbuilders and athletes all put into practice. It's the idea, hear this, of removing anything that can slow you down. The ultimate goal is to optimize your performance and have a victorious outcome. See, I understand even more clearly today why I always used to take my shoes off before I race. Anybody grew up like that? I used to always take my shoes. I'm like, why do you take your shoes off? You know, but what happened is that you want to release. Anybody used to run barefooted? Hey, man, I'm a barefooter. I, hey, man, I got, I, got some, I got some tough feet. They told me how beautiful are the feet that those that preach the gospel. I don't know about that because I done messed up mine. Uh, but I used to take off. I used to, you, you're ready. You say, boom, let me take off my shoes. And you get up there, boy, and, and, you, and you could tell. You, you, you say, they're about to run. They're about to run. They about to go. But what you were doing, I understand even more now, is that I was ridding myself of anything that could slow me down. But this is the awesome part about this, y'all. God is saying, let me have, this is something, it is God, my God. That's why we call this thing in our spiritual life laying aside a weight. Because when God told us to lay aside every weight, he was telling us to streamline our lives so that we can enjoy optimal victory. See, whatever weighs you down can end up ruling your world. Whatever way it can control you, whatever weighs you down can rule your world. What am I saying? God is saying, let me handle the hard stuff and you focus on the easy stuff. My God. I'm, look, bring in the scripture up one more time. Can you bring up um, um, verse number one again? I, I have to say this out loud because this is so important. Bring up verse number one from the New King James, right? Quick. Bam, you there? It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, look at this, let us what? Lay aside every weight, keep going, and what? Sin that so easily, somebody shall easily, ensnares us and let us run with endurance strength the race that was set before us I need y'all to hear this because God in the text even though we want to lay aside every weight he says lay aside every weight and sin that so easily beset us because God is saying let me handle the hard stuff and you focus on the easy stuff because sometimes we are so weighed down with the world on our shoulders that the easy stuff end up eliminating us it's the simple things. See, the easy stuff he was saying, he said, it's the stuff that you can control on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes we're trying to handle all the big problems of our lives. We're trying to handle the world and its problems and its persecution against us. And God said, it's the little things in your life. Those little small things that you got to get rid of. It's those things that when you turn around the corner is there. It's the thing that when you open up your phone or when you, when you, when you open up your mail or you come into your house or you get around your friends. It's those little things in your life that can end up eliminating you from the race. And God is simply saying, I got the best stuff. You handle the easy stuff so you can continue to run the race because you can't fix that anyway. How many know you can't fix all the problems around you, but you can fix the problems that may be right in front of you. Sometimes we miss the little details in our family. I mean, you're trying to take care of everybody and you can't even take care of your own house. Oh, amen to that, somebody. Oh, I'm telling you, in this profession, man, I could be busy taking care of the whole church and miss the little things in my own house. And it'd be those little small things that I could have easily took care of that could end up destroying everything I thought was big in my life. You got to start dealing with the little, somebody shot the little things in my life. 
you got to start dealing with those things because that's how you streamline your life. I'm learning. I'm telling you, y'all, it's amazing what God is showing us in this moment. He said, let us side every way and sin that so easily ensnare us. He said, strip down, start running, and never quit because the scripture tells us that they are parasitic sins. It ain't the big things that take us out. It don't, it, they're not the big things that always take us and cause us to lose the race. It's those small parasitic things. That, a parasite represents the small stuff, the undetected and the unnoticed. My Jesus. It's the stuff we never notice that end up keeping us from our necks. It's the little bitty things. Some of y'all work on jobs that really require detail. I, I, I'm dealing with even like the people that clean this church, right? They say, Pastor, you so picky. I say, if I let that little problem go, I say, I ain't micromanaging. I'm just trying to make sure. That the little things, that, see, if you ain't paying attention to the little things in your life, you got your mind on all, everybody want a big house, a big, jo a big, a big house, a big car, but don't want to work a little job. <laughs> okay, let me say that. Hey, Amen. You think you're going to come, you, you out there playing a the lottery. You think going to come out. No, God said you're going to have to work the little thing because the Bible said if you're faithful over little, he'll make you what? Ruler over much. See, it's the little things that can get us ensnared that the enemy sometimes make us unnoticed, not, not notice them, or uh, what happens because whatever you don't progress through will end up imprisoning you. It'll cause you to be imprisoned by it. You're like, man, why my mind can't move forward? Why my thoughts are not progressing? Why my life is not becoming what God has purposed? Because God's saying those little things that you ain't progressed from will cause you to be imprisoned by them things because you can always tell when someone is carrying unwanted baggage you can always tell it they're down they out this is what God is saying because the weight on your attitude and your performance will keep you from progressing that's why you got to lay aside those weights and sometimes we think that what God did in our life was a persecution God said no I was laying aside weights that you weren't willing to let go God said I, mean, I, could, I could cause some things to happen in your life that will remove weights that you would have kept on and some of us would have kept hold of those things to the day we died if God didn't cause it to hurt us first because sometimes we don't change because we see the light many of us change because we feel the heat and the things that come upon our life will cause us to say God why I'm going through this God said you ain't going through a whole lot right now what you're going through is what going to get you to what I already promised you I rid you of some things that you probably would never rid yourself of and it's those small things that will keep us from progressing in God's promises Imagine watching an Olympic runner run around the track carrying 50-pound weights and everybody leaving them behind. Would you just stand and look at the screen and say, keep it running? You would yell out and say, let that stuff go. Get rid of that stuff so you can get there faster, get there more victoriously. And so many times in our life, we can hold on to those things that will keep us from seeing the will of God. But I'm telling you the truth today, y'all, that if we learn how to let some things go, those little small things in our life that, that we feel like we can control, because look at this, let me tell you this, y'all. It's those small things that we feel like we got control over. Jesus Christ. Oh, I can handle this one. I can deal with this. I can, I'm telling me, this is those small things that we say, God, you know, this is, this is with them. God said, that's, that's the stuff you got to deal with. You're going to have to really focus on those things so that God can get you to the things that he's purposed and promised for you. I want to re finish reading this scripture right here. Bring that other scripture, verse number two, real quickly to you. I, I got, I'm, I'm already out of time. I got a lot more to say, but I'm going to finish this some other day. Amen. Somebody say, be quiet, Pastor. Don't say that. It says in verse number two, it says, the reason how we're going to do this is that we can't always look at our circumstances. We're going to have to look to Jesus. Somebody shout, look to Jesus. It says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author, I need y'all to hear this, and the finisher. That means he was the one that wrote the story, and he's the one going to close the book on it. He's the one that put the manuscript together. 
and he's the one going to make a masterpiece out of this mess. I mean, it's the way God works in our, so what happens is that God, no matter what I'm facing right now, no matter what weight is on me, God, I'm ridding myself of that. And the only way I'm going to rid myself of that is that I got to look unto Jesus. It says, the author and finishers of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I don't know about you, but it's hard to find joy when you're, feeling, when you're going through some trials in your life. It's hard to feel joy when it feels like everything and everyone has forsaken you. It's hard to feel joy when you feel like, man, God, I can't even pay the bills that are in front of me and I can't imagine what next month is going to look like. I mean, it's hard to find joy, but when you look at God, God said, if you keep looking to me, the one who already dealt with that, despised the, despised the shame, he says, I've already made sure that you understand that there's a place for you, that there's a place that you can call on. That's why I shared last week again, again and again, is that we got to look to the throne of God every chance we get because he's seated at a place that proves that he got through whatever problem, whatever circumstance that could have knocked him out of the race. And I always share, share this with others and I say this to myself every day. It's easy to save yourself. It's easy for you to get out of what you're going through and only person you would save is yourself. But is this, you got to endure that thing every single day. You got to say, God, I don't care how it looks. I'm designed and I desire to get stronger out of this. I desire to make sure that no matter what comes in my life, no matter what comes against me, my family, the church, your friends, your loved ones, you got to say, God, I'm going to stand my ground because I des I'm designed to become stronger out of this this. Anybody know that with, regardless of what you may face in your life, that God is always causing something that was already in you to come out of you. God can pull something. So every time you let something go, God can cause you to cause some mess to be used in your life. Sometimes we don't know what we got in, to, in us because we got so much stuff on us. Sometimes we don't know what God has already placed on the inside of us because we're carrying so much things outside of us. And so God said, get rid of that so I can bring out of you that which I've already placed on the inside of you. I need somebody to talk to yourself today and say, what's in me is going to come out of me and everything that God has purposed for me, I will see it fulfilled in my life. He endured it. Such hostility. Such hostility. I'm going to pick back up on this in another week or so. So many times, and I had to keep, I got to kind of keep going back to the easy stuff. Because sometimes the easy stuff seems so hard, so difficult. But we all know what those things are. And I want to encourage you today to deal with it. Like, I mean, I, I ain't say deal with everybody, I say deal with it. Deal with it. Those things on the inside of you that can separate you from God. And cause you not to fulfill God's purpose in your life. Those things that nobody else probably know but you. God said, I need you to deal with those things. Be more intentional. Be more intentional about those things that I've intended for you to do. Don't just let it go. Don't just let it just bypass you. Pay attention to those things. Those things that sometimes can cause you to get off track and you not know you off track. Cause you to be off focus and you don't even know you off focus until it's too late. So I encourage you, I beseech you, Bethra brethren and sisters, that you handle those things and you walk in the things that God has purposed you to do. And the way we're going to do that is by continually, progressively ridding ourselves of those weights because there are witnesses that says you can make it through. There are witnesses that say to you every day that you're stronger than you think you are. Oh, you can do it. I'm telling you, maybe nobody in your family ever did it, but you can. Or oh, I'm telling you, sometimes we're tormented by what someone never did, and we think we can never do it. But today is going to be the day that you're going to walk in the fullness of God for your life. You're going to let that mindset go. You're going to let the weight of the pressures of never, ever seeing nobody else do it go? You're going to let go of the weight of saying, God, I don't, even know, I don't even know if I possess the qualities or the capabilities? Some of us have let our inadequacies and incapabilities keep us from God's purpose and promises for our life. 
never another day. I let it go. Somebody shout, I let it go. Those things you can do yourself. So many times we're saying, God, get rid of it. God say, no, you just decide today that it's going to be your last day. Dealing with that. Looking at yourself as inadequate. Maybe they don't say they love you enough. That don't mean you can't love yourself. Maybe you never had a mom or a dad there. That don't mean that you can't be a good parent. Sometimes you got to do for the first time something you've never done in your lifetime. And it starts today. It starts right away. But the way we're going to do it is by ridding ourselves of those things that can easily weigh us down and keep us from progressing to God's promise.